Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. What a great testimony to who uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus is and what we believe about him. Welcome to Eastview on a beautiful, snowy, wintry day. So glad you guys are here. It's good to be inside here and celebrating who we believe Jesus to be. And if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus yet, just everything you've seen so far, everything you've heard so far, this is what we believe. We trust in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's all we got. Sometimes it's all we got. And if that's all we got, that's enough. And so I hope you're uh, uh, glad to be here today. If you're visiting, we want to make you feel at home. You can text hello to that number on the screen. You can visit us in the family room when it's all said and done. Especially want to give a shout out to, uh, we have some people here who are visiting uh, and are going to offer us a chance to serve in this community. And so there's a display. Jason's going to talk about that later. But if you've made your way in here or you're listening out in the hallway, God bless you guys for being here as our visitors. And one more shout out to the people in Washington today who are uh, trying this, to launch this campus over it near Peoria. God bless you guys. And uh, we're praying with you for that. Yeah, you can get excited about that. Alicia in Colorado, the Beckmans in Florida, Vicki listening online. God bless you all and everybody on the online campus. Well, uh, we're going to get to Daniel chapter 3 today. So I hope you have your Bibles. Open them up to Daniel 3. It's in the Old Testament. Um, and, and I want to start with, have you ever heard this, this, uh, this expression, to be refined by fire? You're, you're, you're refined by fire? What, what does that mean, to be refined by fire? Well, in the world of metals and metallurgy, which I'm proficient at, uh, <laughs> it's a process called smelting in which they take an iron ore of some kind of metal and it's heated in a furnace at extremely high temperatures to extract the pure metal itself. So gold and silver and copper and iron, all these other base metals, they begin as just a bunch of junk and they get melted down to become pure in, their, uh, in the way that they present themselves. In the spiritual world, Prophets like Malachi and Isaiah and Zechariah speak of this refining by fire as God purifying us, taking away all of the sins in our lives, we see Jesus in that, and also then making us into something useful for his kingdom in a way that we can't fully understand and it really makes sense to us in the moment because I know I've been in the moment and some of you are in the moment right now. In a way that doesn't make sense, the furnace the, the, the refining of the furnace of faith is part of the Christ-following life. Which brings us today to Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, or Daniel chapter 3. <laughs> Daniel chapter 3. And we're back in Babylon. Welcome to Babylon again. Perhaps the most famous furnace story of all time. These three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and let me fill you in before we start reading here in verse 13. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, the great king who's conquered most of the world, decides, I've got tons of gold. I'm going to make a tall statue. And he makes a statue in the plain of Dura, obviously a place that's flat so people can see it from miles away. 90 foot tall statue really don't know what it is. We'll talk about that later. But he calls a dedication ceremony. Don't know how long it took to make, but uh, it, it's, it's an incredible feat of construction back in the day. And then he calls this huge celebration. He calls all of his officials uh, from all over the world, the Babylonian provinces, and he puts together a band. And the band, uh, the, 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 uh, the um, instruments are named there. It gives us some insight into some of the old instruments, six or seven instruments. He puts together this band. He calls this great celebration, and he gives this command. When the music begins, everyone must fall down and worship this big, tall gold thing. That's the command. And in the Eastern um, practice, it would involve, just like Muslims do today, of bowing your face to the ground and touching your forehead to the dirt. Everyone has to bow. No exceptions. Here it is. There's the big tall gold thing. Music plays. You bow. We call this worship. And that's what happens. The music plays. Everyone bows except these three guys who stand out like a sore thumb, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And of course, because they do stand out, it gets back to the king. Everyone bowed down to your image, king, except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's always a tattletale. And then it comes to Daniel chapter 3, verse 13. I'm going to read this story because it's great. Listen, if you want to hear another great Bible story, here it is. Chapter uh, 3 of Daniel, verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be bought, brought. So they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image that I have set up? 
Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good, but if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace, and who is the God who will be able to deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and, we, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. No. <laughs> then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace, that these men were and then these men were bound in their cloaks and their tunics and their hats and their other garments. They were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace because the king's order was urgent and the furnace was overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. And he answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over their bodies. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, no smell of fire had come upon them. And Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's commands and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any other God except their own God. Is that a great story or what? Amen. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us in this moment. God, would you come now? Every person that's listening, would you draw our hearts in? What a great story. And there's so much to be learned for us today as we try to live fearless in Babylon. I pray that you give me Holy Spirit power to say what you want to say, nothing more and nothing less. And that in, in the way that only you can do through this preached word of God and lifting up the living word Jesus, that thousands of sermons will be taken in now. God, would you increase our trust in you? We admit sometimes it's hard to trust. Would you increase our trust? And if there's someone who's never trusted you as Lord and Savior, may today be the day, God. I pray it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Life in Babylon is not easy for the exiled people of God. That's what we've been saying for three weeks. You live in Babylon. It's not easy to be people of, who follow God in a culture that does not honor God-following people and does not embrace God-following ideals. We live in Babylon, and it's hard sometimes. And I hope that you've seen, I hope you've been here for the first two sermons we've, we've shared together in this series in Daniel, because to live fearless in Babylon, we have these words. The first word was resolve. You got to resolve. I ain't eating what Babylon's serving, right? And then the second word last week is prayer. If you're going to sur survive Babylon, you are going to have to pray, pray, and pray some more. Today, we come to the third word, and it's found in this key verse. I'm going to put it up here again. It's in your Bibles if you want to look down there. And if you're the kind of people who write in your Bibles like I have been since I'm six years old, I used to write different things. But uh, anyway, uh, now I write notes in my Bible. And if you're that kind of person, find, find your uh, verse 28 and circle this word trusted. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and delivered his servants because they trusted God. They trusted him. They, they knew that they could depend on God. That's the word we're going to talk about today. The, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to um, resolve in Babylon. We're going to have to pray in Babylon. And we're going to have to trust God like never before. These three boys trusted God. Furnace or no furnace, death or no death, king edict or king threat, they trusted one thing. And here's what I want to tell you something. In Babylon, you're going to face some fiery furnaces. 
I, I'd like to tell you, once you come to Jesus Christ, it's just like one skipping uh, you know, party into heaven and that's the end of the story, but that's not the way it is. We live in Babylon. There's all kinds of furnaces and all kinds of fires that we face. We've all faced them or we're currently facing them or we will in the future face them physically, mentally, emotionally. But if that's true, here's the fearless Babylon survival tip. If you can survive, if you can trust something or someone to get you through the fire, that's who you should trust. That's who you should put your trust in. Which leads us to this first question that I have there in your outlines, if you're playing along at home, is there in verse 15, it's the question that King Nebuchadnezzar asked, who is the God who will deliver you? That's a good question. He's saying it in a threatening way. He's saying, you guys think that you're gonna be smart Alex, and have faith in your Hebrew God. I'm gonna throw you in the fiery furnace. You are going to die. And then who is the God who will be able to save you from my hands? Now remember, this, this whole story may seem weird to you because you're not ancient East, you know, 2,800 years ago. It sounds weird that you would watch a guy build a statue in the middle of the plain and go, yeah, that's God, let's worship. But you have to understand in the culture of Babylon that it's a polytheistic world. And the image of gold was just another God to them. By the way, a lot of scholars have, have debated what is this image? Is it an image of Nebu, which was the namesake of Nebuchadnezzar? Maybe that ancient God, it was a big 90 foot Nebu. Uh, or maybe it was just, maybe it was um, Nebuchadnezzar himself. And he was just so you know, full of himself, he said, I'm gonna make a statue of me. Could be, we don't really know. All we know is that he built this tall gold image in the middle of the plain, and he said, bow down to a statue. And so for these guys who he commands to bow down, everybody goes, well, there's the God of this, the God of that, the God of everything that we pray to all the time and sacrifice to all the time. Yeah, it's just another God. So why not? Let's just do what the king says. But Nebuchadnezzar finds these guys saying, I'm not gonna bow down to that because we know that that's not a God nor are any of your gods. Guys, listen, I want you to understand that in Babylon, you're gonna to be told to trust and to bow down and worship images and gods of Babylon. This is a good time for us to consider the gods in our world. We've considered the diet of Babylon that they offer us to eat all the time. The gods are not far, uh, not too different, actually. Um, this is not an exhaustive uh, study, but in my years of studying the Bible and studying ancient cultures and all the false gods of the Greeks and the Romans and the Babylonians and, and uh, even in America, gods basically fall into these three categories. Go look at hist historically. If you come up with another one, send me an email this week and I'll add to this, all right? But there's three basic god categories. The first one, sexuality and fertility. Fertility is very important, especially in the ancient world. We want to carry on our progeny. We want to have more kids. We want to carry on our name and our reputation. And so if you can have tons of kids, that means the gods favor you. Sexuality is a bit self-explanatory. Uh, every god in the, uh, in the Old, Testament, uh, Old Testament time and ancient times, there are gods that promote sexuality. You can go to the temple and make a sacrifice, and then you can worship by having sex with a sexual prostitute. That's the way it is. And sex has been worshiped. Is it still worshiped in our day and age? We'll just go watch, you know, The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. See if it's worshiped. Understand that we have a multi-billion dollar a year sex industry that's in our country, in our culture, that's accessed like that. And ask yourself, do we have a goddess of sex? We do. Just watch just about anything that they sell these days, and they'll use sexuality as a way to sell it. This is a false god of Babylon. The second kind of... Uh, categories is victory and power. Who wins? Who's the best? Who's the greatest? Who's the most famous? Who conquers? There's always a god and goddess of victory and power. Of course, to a king, it was very important because if you can beat all your enemies, if you go out in the name of whatever god it is and you win, guess what? That god favors you. You keep sacrificing to that god. And so victory and power is important. We also have the same thing. We worship talented people. We worship celebrities. We worship people that look good. We worship athletes and musicians and actors and people who go viral on TikTok. We have lots of idols. We have a show that's still popular called American Idol. We idolize people. We worship people who are victorious and powerful and beautiful. And then, of course, prosperity. There's always gods of prosperity in the ancient times. 
prosperity gods make sure that my crops grow and that I have an abundance and I never run out and I'm rich. Now you can see that Nebuchadnezzar worshiping all of these gods, he's going, I must be favored by the gods because I have tons of kids and wives in the harem and I am successful and powerful and I am prosperous. Who's going to stop? Back to the question, who is the God who can rescue you? Who is the God who can, uh, the, the word that he uses, deliver you out of my hands in verse 15? Who's the God? Listen, when you're facing the fiery furnace, the gods of sexuality, the gods of victory and power, the gods of prosperity and abundance mean nothing. When you go, and, and some of you could testify, you could stand up right now and give a five-minute testimony. When times get hard and hot and fiery and trial-like in life, those gods mean nothing. Your money means nothing. Your power means nothing. Your title means nothing. All that you've accomplished means nothing. You would throw it all away in an instance just to go, God, get me through this trial. Get me through this furnace. Power and victory doesn't do you any good. Sex doesn't do you any good. Prosperity doesn't do you any good. In the times of life that feel like we're being thrown into the furnace of threats and fear and anxiety and pain, in those painful furnace moments, again, you've got to answer this question. I don't want everybody here, whether you're a follower, you love Jesus for 400 years, 400. Sometimes I speak English when I preach. For all these years, or you're brand new to the faith, or you've never come before, or you're just checking Eastview out online, listen, here's the question. Who is the God who will deliver you? Who's the God that's going to deliver you? And here's the lesson. I would say it this way. You can't bring a small G God to a big G God furnace. That's what Nebuchadnezzar finds out. Because he's talking about gods with a lowercase g, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is saying, we have a God. In one of the most awesome, and I have to confess, smart aleck responses in all the Bible. The gift of sarcasm and, and irony and everything is coming, pouring out of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They probably said it filled with the Holy Spirit, not smart aleck as I would have. But this is the greatest, this is the greatest scene ever because the king is furious, he's raging, he's mad, he's powerful. If you don't do what I'm saying, I'm going to kill you. And then what God can do anything? And they're like, well, here's the deal. We have a God that's able to deliver us. You need to understand something, king, because of the God we trust, we can't do what you're asking and we can't be afraid of what you're threatening. You might want to write that down because maybe that's how you get through this week. You can't do what Babylon is asking you to do because of who you believe in. And you can't be afraid about what Babylon's threatening to have happen in your life because of who you believe in. If you trust God, our God is able to deliver us beginning with Jesus Christ from all of our sins and all of the, the past and all of the death that comes with all those things. I just want you to see what, how people react. This is, so, this is like this moment when he expected these three guys to go, sorry, king, please don't kill us, we'll worship. And they just look at him and say, well, you know, literally this, it says, well, we can tell you this again if you want to, but we have no need to answer you in this matter. I don't, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of our breath, it's a waste of words, but you, I think you know how this is gonna go, king. We're not gonna bow down and worship your gods. Our God is able to deliver us, he will deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we ain't gonna bow. And so, as I said, Nebuchadnezzar flips out. Literally, the the Hebrew says that his face was contorted in a way that it literally didn't look human. He was so angry that his face changed look. And I just want to point out real quick how people react when you don't want to bow down to the gods of Babylon. There, There are three basic reactions. The first one is jealousy. We would back up a little bit, and it's like, why did the Chaldeans come to to Nebuchadnezzar in the first place and say, hey, king, you know, sorry to bother you, but there's three guys from the Hebrew land, and they're not bowing down to your God. Why do they care? Why did it matter to them? Why it mattered to them is, if you remember the end of Daniel chapter 2, they had just been promoted to be over the affairs of Babylon. There's somebody jealous of their success. There's somebody jealous of their status, and they're not even real Chaldeans. They're not even real Babylonians. And they just get jealous of the success of these three. And they're going, we're going to try to take them down. We live in a Babylon where people are jealous of a real faith. The reason they're jealous of a real faith is because real faith, when it plays out in the world, is 
is incomparable to any other kind of belief system there is. And when you start believing in your false gods and you see somebody believing in their real God and they just keep skating through life going, yeah, I've got cancer, but God's in control. Yeah, my kids are a mess, but God's in control. Yeah, I just lost my job, but God's in control. People are like, wait a minute, I want a God like that. And they don't like your success and they don't like your attitude and your joy that you bring. There's also another reaction and anger is that reaction. Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of the Babylonian world that gets angry when our God calls us to something different than the gods of the world. And this is a reality in our world. This world is ticked off that Christians go, no, uh, Jesus is the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one kisses the Father by him. And, and, and when people is like, well, who gave you that right? I, I don't have that right. I just believe what Jesus said. I just believe what he said. That's my belief. But it ticks people off. Well, what about my God? What about this way? What about this belief? It's like, no, that's not what Jesus says. Well, I'm mad at you. I'm angry at you. And you might get some kind of criticism. You might be, get called out on social media. But when people, uh, when you don't agree with their spirituality, people get mad. So there's anger. There's jealousy. There's also fear. One of my favorite parts about this story is, is Nebuchadnezzar's losing his king mind. And, and he says, okay, that, that's it. And look at all these things that he does to these guys. Okay, strongest guys in the army, come here. You bind them up. And just for measure, let's make that furnace seven times hotter. Is 2,000 degrees not hot enough to kill you? He's afraid. He's never seen anyone so confident in their God to deliver them. And he's going, you better make that fire hotter. You better tie them up just in case. And you better get the strongest guys to throw them in. There is a fear that people have when people of faith go, listen, I, this doesn't make sense, but I believe in God. He's going to deliver me from this. And there's a fear that happens. And that's when our trust under fire comes into play. Trusting God when we're under fire is a powerful testimony to those who live in the same scary world we do. Sometimes they get jealous. Sometimes they get angry. Sometimes they get afraid. But often they see in us a faith that is winsome the irresistible part of our vision statement. They say, why? You have something that I want. Now, I just want to make a few notes here before we move on to the last and great point that I want to share with you. But there's something happening here that's a together thing again. I know you get tired of me talking about being in small groups and being in community and being here with other believers. But all throughout the scripture, every time I see a faith story, I go, yeah, they didn't do that by themselves. What if Shadrach would have been alone? He might have bowed down. What if Meshach would have been on his own that day when the king called him in by himself? He might have said, okay, king, blow the trumpets, I'll bow down. But they did this together. Look what it says all the way through their response. It says, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. He will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, be it known that we will not serve. There is something that happens with faith when it's together with other people of faith that you can't replace on your own. Jesus never intended you to walk into the fiery furnace of life by yourself. That's why the community of the church was created so that we can do this together. If you're not convinced that you need to be in a small group, I'm just telling you. Thousands of times in the last 27 years of my existence here at Eastview Christian Church, thousands of times, the small group and the groups that people participate in are the first ones to help them through the fiery furnace. If you're going through a fiery furnace, you better pray that you have a God that can deliver you and also a small group that will walk with you through it. Amen? Okay, I know I'm getting applause from my small groups pastor over there. Amen, brother. But not only do we do this together, but I want you to see what's going to happen. We're going to have to, together, we're going to have to make some choices. In the testimony of the king Nebuchadnezzar in verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel, delivered his servants who trusted in him. Look what they did. Here's what trust looks like. They set aside the king's commands. We're going to have to continually, in this Babylonian existence of ours, keep setting aside the commands of the culture. You need to have this much money. You need to have these kinds of kids. You need to have this kind of marriage. You need to have, and, and there's all kinds of messaging that we get all the time through advertising, through media, telling us who we need to be and what we should be like. 
I'm going to tell you one of the, one of the things that um, was pushed on us in the 1900s, back in the olden days. Somebody, somebody convinced all American parents, you have to buy your kids a car. Do you know that? Can I tell you something? You don't? And I know the teenagers are here going, hey, pastor, come on. You don't have to buy your kids a car. That's just an easy illustration of how the messaging of our world says, you have, if you're a good parent, you buy them a car. My parents were good parents. They didn't buy me a car. They said, you can use the junker when everybody else is done with it. That's how we rolled back in the day. There's a lot of messaging, and that's an easy one and a fun one. There's a lot of messaging that comes in and says, you got to do this. You got to do it this way. You got to have this much money. You got to save for retirement. You got to do this. Listen, we have to set aside the commands of the king. That's what these guys did. Their faith said, We hear you, king. Bow down or you're going to croak. We hear it. We're setting that aside because those don't seem like true words to us. And then in verse 28, they yielded up their bodies. They were willing to sacrifice their lives. Literally, they were willing to die. And most of us will never face death, but in the same way that you set aside the, the commands of the kings to live and thrive and to be fearless in Babylon, we're going to have to give up some stuff. We're going to have to give up some of the things like money, perhaps, or position, or the comforting lifestyle that we all seek all the time. We're going to have to give up popularity, maybe. We're going to have to give up, you know, uh, having everybody like us, perhaps, Maybe you're going to be misjudged. Maybe you're going to be hated. Maybe you're going to be avoided. Maybe you're going to be left out. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know this, that no one comes to follow Jesus Christ without leaving some stuff behind. And in this case, they were willing to leave their life behind because what they trusted. <laughs> so that's the, that's the speech. Nebuchadnezzar gives the threat. You better do this again. By the way, he's got a really bad temper. He's got an anger problem and needs counseling. He's always ripping people's arms off or burning down their houses or throwing people into a fiery furnace. But he gives this final threat. They make their final stand. Nebuchadnezzar gets incredibly angry. And then in verse 23, these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fully clothed, fully bound, are thrown into a fiery furnace. Now, we were talking earlier, a lot of scholars go, what furnace was this? It's very likely the furnace that was used in the smelting of the gold to make this gold statue. It's sitting right there. And so we're going to throw you in. We're going we're to throw you into this refining furnace. And you can go and Google and see what, what this smelting furnace might have historically looked like, but it's, but it's bad. And then all of a sudden, the story twists. Nebuchadnezzar's sitting there going, hey, that shows them. Anybody else want to mess with me today? No? No? Okay. And he starts looking. He goes, hey, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, weren't there three guys? There's a fourth. There's a presence of God. There's one that looks like the Son of God. And then Nebuchadnezzar comes near to the entrance, not too close because he would die. And he says, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, come here. And again, my gift of smart leg would be like, why don't you come get us? But, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm not as faithful as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I would have been tempted anyway. Anyway, so they come out. They come out. And then Nebuchadnezzar makes this confession about their God. I want you to see this. Nebuchadnezzar is one of the most pagan guys in the Old Testament, and he writes some of the greatest worship songs and some of the greatest confessions in the Bible. And here's, here's his confession. God has delivered his servants. The true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This God has delivered his servants. Guys, the furnace and the fire is real. By all human understanding, they should have melted into the history books in this instant. But now they stand before the king alive and unharmed. It's a miracle that only a real God could do. And guys, I believe that we are standing near and close to and facing Babylonian furnaces all the time. Sometimes they come from the persecution of the world. Sometimes they come because of the hatred that we have towards what people perceive the church to be or what Jesus' followers are perceived to be. But often the furnace has nothing to do with persecution and anger of this culture. It's just the reality of life. 
What's your furnace today? What's the furnace that you're facing or that you're in or that you're sure is gonna come back? Maybe it's a, a mental health issue for you. Maybe you're dealing with some depression. Maybe you got some family issue that's breaking your heart as those of you who have gone through those kind of things understand. Maybe it's a lie that's been told about you and people have believed it. Maybe you've been gossiped about. Maybe there's false accusations. Maybe it's a new reality. This is how life works. It's just Monday and all of a sudden, Monday at nine o'clock, something hits and you're like, I didn't see that coming and it's hard and it's devastating and it's new and you don't have the answers. What is your furnace today? Is it cancer? Is it heart issues? Is it your back? You starting the early stages of dementia? Are you homebound? Name your furnace. And now back to that question, is your God able to deliver you from the furnace? Is Jesus able to deliver you from the furnace? And we always have to begin with the first furnace. And if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you just have, you have a, there's a furnace that you're living in that you don't realize. The furnace of your sin, every sin you've ever committed will commit, all the sins of the world gathered together, and that brings death into your life, and you need someone to get you out of the furnace. And our God has delivered his servants from the furnace of sin and death through his son, Jesus Christ. And we'd love to have you be a part of that. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted God. But back in verse 17, I want you to see this again. Our God is able to deliver us. They trusted that and he will deliver us. I don't know what they expected, actually. When you read that story, you're not really sure that they're expecting it to turn out this way. What were they expecting? Maybe God would strike Nebuchadnezzar dead. He's done that before. Maybe they're expecting God to, to come with a big you know, shower, a rainstorm, and just smoke the, the furnace and just put out the fire. Maybe he's gonna bring up strong wind and blow the statue over and kill a bunch of people. Maybe they thought that they were gonna be taken to heaven like Elijah. I don't, here, here's what I need you to understand about the furnace. You don't have to figure it out. You simply have to trust the God who's with you in the furnace. That's what you have to do. How's God gonna do this? Let's pray specifically for a big storm or the statue to fall or Nebuchadnezzar to die of a heart attack because he's got anger issues. Let's pray. Or you can just go, you know what? Let's just trust God. And they can trust God in the fiery furnace because of what they've trusted before. Remember chapter two? The king's already threatened to kill them before. And the Lord revealed a dream to them because they prayed to the God of heaven and he revealed what the dream was. So when you start threatening people for, for death and they've experienced death before, it's kind of like, well, okay. 10 years from now, if some king threatens to throw these guys into the fiery furnace, they go, been there and done that. I mean, I, I'm still scared, but I can look in the past and know that my God is able to deliver me. I trust that he will. The next furnace after this, many of us in here today, we have a faith that's based on the furnaces we've been through. I've been through some furnaces, have you? And the reason I know that the next furnace I face, Lord, please not today, the next furnace I face, the next furnace I face, I'm gonna trust the God that's got me through the furnace. And that's what Paul says in this great verse, 2 Corinthians 1, 9 and 10. He's the apostle and he's getting killed for his faith or being threatened to die for his faith. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. That's what we trust, that whatever fiery furnace we face today, we can trust God to get it through, get us through. And if you're here today and you go, I, I wanna trust, Pastor, I just, I need somebody to help me trust. We're here to help you trust. There are old people around here that have been through a lot of furnaces and if you ask them, hey, how'd you get through? They'll say, because we trusted Jesus and we'll pray with you and we'll help you. But still, I don't know that I've preached the gospel yet of this sermon. I want you to hear this. Don't miss the miracle of this whole furnace issue. When it came time to trust, these guys understood God as having two options. And they trusted God either way. God's either going to somehow miraculously get us out of this furnace, or 
He's not. Did you see that as part of the option? Even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't deliver us, we know that that's not a God. We're not bowing down and worshiping your gods. We trust our God, even if he doesn't get us out of the furnace. There are two options. Either God's gonna get us out, he's gonna deliver us, or he's gonna deliver us some other way, he's gonna take us to heaven. You know what they didn't expect? And really nobody expected? Is that instead of just speaking from heaven and just doing something miraculous, or instead of just bringing his voice to heaven with him, God joined them. That's the miracle. That a God would come and be with us in the furnace. And that's the story of Jesus. We're not really sure who this other person was that looked like a son of the gods. Maybe an angel. Maybe Jesus himself. A lot of people guess a lot of things. What I know is it was God himself coming and saying, I will be with you in the furnace. And that is something that Nebuchadnezzar and probably Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had never considered, that there's a God who will come into my furnace with me. And I believe that still happens today through Jesus Christ. So we want to offer you an invitation today for prayer. I'm going to ask the elders if they would, and, and we've asked several elders to come and just line up here at the front, guys, if you would. And we've asked their wives to come with them because we know that some, some people might not feel comfortable talking to a guy. So we've got um, godly elders and we've got their wives down here with them. And they're ready to pray for you today. What's your furnace? As a matter of fact, why don't you go ahead and stand, put your Bibles aside. And, and I know you're probably going, man, I want to beat everybody else to the restaurant I'm going to. But for just a moment, let the spirit work. And what is the furnace that you're experiencing or the furnace that's on the horizon, the experience, the furnace you've just come through, and how could we pray for you? We just wanna be down here to pray with you and for you. We have oil, the, the Bible says in James 5, if any is sick among you, call the elders and anoint them with oil and pray for healing and the God of all faith will heal. We're just gonna give you a time now just to come forward and be prayed over. Help, help, let us walk with you through the furnace and let God bring healing to your life. So as, as it's real simple, as the band and the musicians and the vocalists sing, as the Spirit leads you, come forward and uh, we'll, just, we'll just pray for the furnace that we're in. Amen.